Alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lah wa may yudlil fala hadiya lah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah Ittaqullah haqqa tuqatih Wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun We begin by praising and thanking Allah the majestic, the supreme, the magnificent, declaring his absolute oneness, seeking from him guidance, asking of him forgiveness, turning to Allah the Almighty for refuge from sinning as well as protection from the consequences of our sins. Whomever Allah the exalted guides none can lead that person astray. And whomever Allah who Azza wa Jal does not guide, none other can ever guide them. I bear witness to the declaration of truth, to the testimony of faith, that there is no God except for the one and only true God, Allah, and that Muhammad, may Allah who Azza wa Jal, peace and blessings forever and always be upon him, that he is his final prophet and messenger for all of humanity. I remind you, brothers and sisters, of what I myself am reminded of when Allah the Exalted tells us, O oh, you who believe, guard your relationship with Allah and cherish Allah as He deserves to be cherished and be sure that you do not die except in full submission to Allah as Muslims. Before I begin, I'm going to ask that inshallah ta'ala we make it a sunnah of moving in and filling in the places so that we can make room for everyone else. Ramadan is a month of generosity and generosity is expressed in so many ways. One of them is financial. But there's also generosity of sharing space. And we should care for the rest of our brothers who are perhaps sitting on the concrete or standing or whatever the case is. The same thing for the sisters. Make some room, inshaAllah. Last week, we learned about being grateful and being appreciative and thankful as one of the major lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want from His servants with the month of Ramadan and all that the month entails of worship and the lessons learned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended the ayat with لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ with the hope that you will be from those who are grateful and appreciative and thankful making this in and of itself an objective, a goal to be sought out for, to be, to be planned to, to attain, to strive for within this blessed month of Ramadan. And today, inshallah, we're going to learn a little something about how we can achieve that beautiful character trait, that value of being, of being grateful, of being thankful, of being appreciative. And it is also taught within these ayat of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the especially merciful. He tells us beginning the ayat of Ramadan saying, Tabarak wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usriyam. 
كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون Oh you who believe Fasting has been ordained for you It has been prescribed for you It has been made mandatory for you Just as it was made mandatory for the people who came before you Ya Allah why? Why did you make siyam? Why did you make it an act of worship for us? Why is it one of the pillars of Islam? Ya Allah, what is it that we should get out of it? Ya Rabb, what is it that we should be able to learn from it? What is there in added value with regards to this for us? Help us understand, Ya Allah. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In the same way that Allah ended, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ here he's saying, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may hopefully have taqwa. The quality of taqwa. <laughs> so taqwa, brothers and sisters, is a major pathway. It is a major way, form, avenue, means by which we can attain that most valuable quality of shukr. But what is taqwa? A lot of the times if you read translations, it may just flat out say, and fear Allah. Right? And fear Allah. Well, I want to use a definition that was given by none other than one of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, of the rightly guided predecessors. Someone who was also from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam It is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wa ardahu Wherein he tells us At-taqwa huwa al-khawfu min al-jaleel Wal-amalu bil-tanzeel Wal-qana'atu bil-qaneel Wal-isti'adad liyawm al-raheem What did he tell us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with the highest of places in paradise along with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the rest of us with them, Allahumma ameen. He described and defined taqwa as being al-khawfu min al-jaleel. Having fear from the majestic Allah azza wa jalla. Having fear from Allah the majestic subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us understand that the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal is twofold, two ways. The first is to fear in the sense of yes, having that, that fear inside of you of Allah Azza wa Jal's punishment. Because Allah Jalla wa Ala can do what no one else can do. And that when and if we're thinking to do something of wrong, something of haram, something of harm, something of major sins, we should invoke that aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we prevent ourselves from, from doing it. But there's a level that's even higher than that. What is that? It is the fear of Allah azza wa jal that's associated with love. So when we say, how's that? They almost seem opposites, love and fear. Maybe with everyone and everything else except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala is the only one that when we fear Him, that we run to Him, that we turn to Him. Everyone and everyone and everything else, when you fear it, you want to be as far away from Him as you can. But Allah azza wa jalla is the opposite. The love that we should have for Allah is such that we fear ever being ungrateful to Allah. That we fear ever disobeying Allah Azza wa Jalla. That we fear letting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala down. And the more that we know Allah Jalla wa ala, the greater our understanding and acknowledgement and appreciation for His blessings. His blessings of Wallahi, brothers and sisters, Allah's blessings are the most valuable blessings of all. Money cannot buy the blessings that Allah gives. He gives life. He gives health. He gives us intelligence. He gives us family. 
He gives us guidance. And the list can go on and on and on and on. Acknowledging these things with Allah should motivate us with love such that we want to live righteously and that we don't disappoint Allah subhanahu wa So al-khawfu min al jaleel And part of what that love should mean of taqwa is that we're going to do what? Al-amalu bi tanzeel We're going to work, we're going to apply what He has given and revealed the revelation. وَالْعَمَلُوا بِالْتَنْزِيلِ To understand that Allah Azza wa Jalla gave us the Qur'an هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ He has given it as guidance for all of humanity. Well, who from humanity should be the first of people to understand it and to live by it and to teach it and to hold to the standards of it? Isn't it we, the Muslims? Absolutely. Absolutely part of taqwa is that we live by what Allah has given us of guidance, tabarak wa ta'ala. Especially because we know that Allah's teachings are for our own benefit. Let nobody be fooled into thinking that Allah and or His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have made things haram because they don't want us to enjoy life. Because they don't want us to have a good time. Because they don't want us to celebrate and to party and to... SubhanAllah. Nor think that Allah makes us do certain things that He makes them prescribe, that He commands them because He wants to make life difficult for us, because you know He wants to ruin our fun and happiness. Absolutely not. These teachings, if we were to understand, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَىٰ Allah Azza wa Jal, if any, any type of an example is to be made, Allah is perfect. In the same way that if we could understand, the relationship of loving parents towards their child. They place these safe boundaries around them to protect them. So that they can grow and that they can inshallah azza wa jal become the best of what Allah intends for them to be while trying to minimize what can harm them while at the same time trying to maximize what can be to their benefit. What happens with our children? What happens when you tell them don't do this? Kind of the same thing that when Allah tells us as adults, don't do this, right? Allah help us. We should recognize that our obedience to Allah Jalla wa ala, it has ramifications with regards to our relationship with everything else as a whole. And these are reminders from Allah. Al-amal al-tanzeel. Wallahi, it's for our own good. And this is something that we need to understand that one of the things that Allah Azza wa Jalla transformed the world with through Islam is that he placed each and every individual accountable for themselves. So when we're talking about the state of the Ummah, and I'm sure that if you ever watch the news, it's more than enough to kind of ruin your day. And we feel sad and we feel hurt and we see all sorts of horrors Allah protect us. And I was told as Shaykh Yusuf, Allah bless him, that one of his coined words is that he would say, Ummat Kharam. Allah protect us. But we need to understand we have a role in things. It's too easy to point the finger and say, yeah, those guys over there, they're not doing their job. Yeah, these guys over here like this. And... But we don't want to realize that each and every one of us is a puzzle piece within that collection of what the puzzle is supposed to represent and portray. They say in English that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Every one of us has a role. And if we think that, yeah, you know, that's a good idea, let somebody else do it. And everybody keeps kicking it along the road, down, 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 down. Well, who's going to do it? We got to stop that mentality, Allah Musta'an, where we think, yeah, Habibi, if they're not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Now, we need to be the change. We need to be the role model. We need to be that blessing that we're expecting from others and others. Al-amal bi tanzil. This is what we're talking about here. al What is he talking about when he's telling us to be content with little? Is he saying to be content with little of ibadah? Alhamdulillah, mashallah, I prayed you know, today. 
I won't have to pray tomorrow. Alhamdulillah, I came for Juma. I don't have to make the five prayers for the rest of the week. Alhamdulillah, I fasted Ramadan. I don't got to worry about, you know. No, Wallahi, it's never about the acts of worship because worship for us is how we show our love to Allah, how Allah wants us to show our love to Him. Too much is never enough. But it's with regards to these other worthless things in this dunya that distract us. Where we think that if I can amass more and more and more of wealth, as if that's going to somehow or the other bring me happiness and or secure for me paradise. But we realize that most people who unfortunately have directed their attention towards this world and its glitter, that it's ruined them and their loved ones that we should be content. It doesn't mean by that we're not supposed to work, we're supposed to remain ignorant and just, you know, kick back and say, hey, Allah's gonna provide. That doesn't mean that at all either. Because Islam is the beautiful balance of spirituality as well as laws. It is the beautiful balance of putting your trust in Allah as well as you doing your part. But don't we see that so many relationships is, is, is ruined because of competition, because of jealousy, because of worldly things? How many times have you not heard of maybe even relatives where brother and brother don't talk because of nonsense? Because of what? Because of Arabah min dunya qaleem Because of something simple and worthless of this dunya وَلِسْتِعْدَادُ الْيَوْمِ الرَّحِيمِ To prepare for the day of your journey, your trip SubhanAllah We've had four janazas up till now, today there's going to be another one. These are reminders. These are reminders. Reminders that this ticket of ours, it's there. It's been pre-purchased for us. You can't give it back. You can't change what's there or the date. Well, alhamdulillah, we don't know what it is. Because imagine having a date stamped on you, knowing when you're going to die. Some of us may think, yeah, it'll be better, at least I'll know when I can repent and... SubhanAllah. You think so? Or will the anxiety just completely debilitate you and destroy you? Will it depress you to a point where you just... Life is almost worthless. To prepare for that day, because it's going to come. The believer is the one who when they think about it, they know that they're leaving as the Prophet ﷺ said, al dunya sijn al-mu'min wa jannatul kafir. That this dunya is a prison for the believer and it is paradise for the disbeliever. The believer knows that what Allah has promised subhana, what His Messenger ﷺ has promised, that's what they're longing for. So they're not just having false thoughts of thinking, yes, I'm going to go to MashaAllah, to Jannah, and I'm going to have, and I'm going to have, and I'm going to have, without al istidad, without the preparation that's needed. And honestly, this journey of mine, this move from Chicago to Dallas, it was a reminder for me. It was a reminder. Because when you leave and you move, we forget sometimes that we're not meant to be forever in one place. And this life was never meant to be forever. And we can get so comfortable sometimes, so settled in. And we have plans, mashaAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His mercy and kindness, He wakes us up. He nudges us a bit to help us realign ourselves. In the same way that, mashaAllah, the departments of transportation place those little bridges on the sides of the highway so that if for whatever reason you veer off a bit too much, it kind of, it wakes you to save your life. We need to prepare for that moment. الْإِسْتِعْدَادُ الْيَوْمِ الرَّحِيمِ Ahibba, if we can just understand this definition of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in understanding what Allah is saying so that you will hopefully have and be from those who have the qualities of taqwa 
Wallahi, we would be blessed people. We would have happiness in a way that if only pharmaceuticals could produce some type of drug to sell. We would be from the most blessed of people in our relationships with our families and our friends. It would be the next closest thing to what there is in paradise. But it's not going to come without us actively striving to fulfill these things. And this is where our Iman, our belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, our love of Allah Subhanahu is that motivation, that driving force inside of us, that regardless of what everybody else is or isn't doing, that we realize the individual obligation that each and every one of us has with Allah to do our part. سيد ابن آدم أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الله سبحانه وتعالى brothers and sisters he ends three ayat within the Quran saying إن الله يحب المتقين والله يحب المتقين والله يحب المتقين and one of those three is فإن الله يحب المتقين Indeed, verily, certainly, for sure, indeed, inna. And the Arabic is telling you something that you have no doubt about. And we should understand that when Allah Jalla Shaykhnuhu is telling us something and He's using these Arabic articles for emphasis and to affirm, we shouldn't have an Adam's doubt within our hearts of what Allah is telling us. What does He say? That for sure that he Allah Azza wa Jal yuhibbu yuhibbu al-muntaqeen that he loves the people who have worked on this quality of taqwa such that it actually becomes a character trait and that's something that they can become identified by Allah loves them can you imagine that Allah Azza wa Jal loves you? Shouldn't we all acknowledge that that is the absolute goal in our lives? That we have Allah, Rabbu Samawati wal Ard, Al Hayyu Al Qayyum, that He loves us? That if Allah Jalla wa Ala loves you, you will be the most blessed person. You will be the happiest person. You want an example of that for proof? Look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The hardships that he suffered and endured. I don't think that any of us will ever have those hardships. The burdens that he had to bear, none of us will bear those burdens. The sacrifices that he made Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, none of us will make those sacrifices. The abuse that he took sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none of us, none of us will endure such abuses. And yet with that, the abi wa ummi huwa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the most happiest, the most blessed person that walked the earth. Why? Because of his relationship with Allah. Allah Jalla So we should really be concerned about this quality of taqwa. We should really focus on making sure that we are going to pay attention to what Ali radiallahu ta'ala gave us of those four, Ali gave us of those four conditions, the finding force for taqwa is. And this month of Ramadan, Ahibba, it starts for us tonight. We're going to go into this month and we're excited and we're seeking Allah Azzawajal's love, we're seeking Allah's mercy, we're seeking Allah's forgiveness, we're seeking Allah's bounties. We're hoping that Allah Azzawajal writes us down and records us in His record book of those who He will save and protect from being punished in the grave as well as in hell, Allahumma Ameen. And that He will have it recorded down in that book as being among those that will be granted paradise. 
Allahumma amin. But there's an issue. There's an issue that if we don't want to understand it and set it straight, it is going to prevent any and all of this from happening. What is it? Listen to this hadith. And Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu an the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala تفتح أبواب الجنة وتعرض أعمال في كل يوم الاثنين والخميس فيغفر لكل عبد لا يشرك بالله شيئا إلا إلا رجلا كانت بينه وبين أخيه شحناء فيقال للملائكة أو يقول الملائكة دعوهما this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The Messenger وسلم, said the doors of paradise open and all deeds are presented on each and every Monday and Thursday. Such that every person who doesn't associate partners with Allah is forgiven. Except. We're going to pause here for a second. Every Monday and Thursday, our deeds are taken and presented to Allah Rabbul Alameen. This is one of the reasons why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. So he's in an act in a state of worship when his deeds are being presented to Allah Jalla wa Ala. And every one of Allah's slaves and servants who does not in any way commit shirk, they will be forgiven. Except. Except who? Except for the person who has enmity with their brother. And let's understand by this, it doesn't have to literally be the brother of your mother and your father. This is ukhuwa fi Islam also. It doesn't necessarily have to be between the same gender. It can be between male and female. Relative, non-relative that have in their hearts an un-Islamic feeling regarding that other person. Where they are angry with them, where they dislike them, or maybe they even detest and despise the person. But yet, mashaAllah, they're praying, they're fasting, they're reading Quran, they're remembering Allah, they're giving charity, They're doing all different acts of ibadah. But because of what's in their heart with regards to this particular person, the angels, it'll be said to the angels, or the angels will say, leave these two. Leave them until they fix the problems between themselves. I want us to pay attention to this. Because Ramadan is beginning, we're going to fast all day, we're going to worship Allah throughout the day in our prayers, reading Quran, remembering Allah, asking Allah for forgiveness, giving in charity, all of the different acts of worship, standing at night. The last thing we want to do is to think that MashaAllah, this stuff is just Allah is accepting it and Allah is filling it in our scale of good deeds and our bank account with Allah is becoming MashaAllah and yet in reality it's all on hold and Allah only knows how long this may have been the case that our deeds have been on hold and Allah forbid that He takes our soul and we never, we never fix, we never resolve the problem with the other person. And I want to begin by mentioning the relationship between husbands and wives. It is so unfortunate. Allah guide us. Say Ameen. Ameen. Allah guide us that the basic, most fundamental unit of the family, the husband and wife, that we get married, and yet our commitment to each other is nowhere where it needs to be. That our love for each other is nowhere where it needs to be. Our mercy towards each other is nowhere where it needs to be. Our trusting of each other is nowhere where it needs to be. 
So much so that we have basically opened the floodgates to shaitan to say, here, come, do what you want. Such that the marriages of Muslims in America, forget about other places, in America, have basically equaled the marriages of non-Muslims in the quantity of divorces that take place. Don't we understand that when you get married, you have made an oath, you have entered into a contract by Allah to do everything that you can to save the family. Don't we understand that from the five main principles of the Sharia, maqasid al-Sharia is hifz al-usra or hifz al-nasl, is to preserve and to protect the family. But how are we going to do this if we're not going to have the taqwa that's needed? Whereas men, we think that just because we're men, we can get angry. Because we're men that our honor, our pride, our, our respect, we get all puffed up. Or that the sisters, because they're women, that they have the rights to be emotional, and to think, and to say, and to do. To make matters worse, subhanAllah, y'all mean that there's children involved and the immaturity of the adults is to the level of these children. Muslims, brothers and sisters, and I'm talking about Muslims, people that make salah, that fast, that love Allah Azza wa that love His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If the basic unit of the family is so flimsy that we don't care to preserve it, that we do not understand that by Allah Azza wa Jal, we have to take every step necessary to preserve it because what does Allah just say? وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْكُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا We have taken from you a very firm, a very strong, a very severe oath and contract. We think that we can play like that? That we can abuse or exploit or hurt or treat each other in ways that Allah does not love? And if that's the case with husband and wife, what do you think is going to then happen with regards to siblings? Don't we understand the environment in the home is going to make all the difference? All the difference with regards to who's in that home? Siblings between themselves. And then those children with regards to their parents. And then the circle just grows. It just grows. If we're not going to understand that taqwa is something that I have to focus on because of Allah with everyone. Regardless of how they respond, how they treat me, what they think, what they say, what they do, because at the end of the day, you want to, you want to know something, brothers and sisters? We have no say or control over anybody else. But Allah is going to question us and hold us accountable regarding ourselves. And ultimately, if we can learn in this month of Ramadan, strive to attain this quality of taqwa so that we can be from those who are going to truly be thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal for all of His blessings. Then inshallah ta'ala will become deserved of what Allah the Exalted says. Tilka al-jannatu allati nurithu min ibadina man kana taqiyya That is the garden of paradise which we will cause to inherit those of our servants that were what? Taqiyya. That had that quality of taqwa. They lived by it and they died by it. Allah Azza wa Jalla blesses to be from them. Allah